try to be rather short and to the point with what I say here at the beginning about the book of Psalms. Perhaps in our regular week, day to day, we may read from the Psalms. Uh, Christians throughout uh, church history have often looked to the Psalms in all kinds of different circumstances and situations because the Psalms often resonate in ways that other parts of Scripture, not that they can't, but at at least with the Psalms it's much easier because Psalms cover a, a lot more of situations and places that you may find yourself in life. And no doubt some of the people who wrote some of these Psalms would have been in that, those same situations. And so they offer us a lot in, in that regard. But when you think about Psalms, and, and when you read Psalms, just for instance, in, 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 uh, in an English Bible, you see that the versification and the way it, the text is structured is very different from, say, if you pick up and start reading from Genesis or Joshua, something like that. Because Psalms often come in the form of poetry. And although I I could probably say a lot about different types of biblical poetry when it comes to the way writers use parallelism, which is basically using one line of words that express one thought, and the line below it says the same thing but uses different words. And so not that they mean two different things, but that they're saying the same thing. And so that's one feature of biblical poetry. But beyond just scripture, poetry infiltrates every aspect of life, at least when you think about it. I mean, poetry in in the sense of literature, but poetry also in the sense of song, of music. And today, oftentimes, people put their feelings to words, how they want to express their emotion and their anxieties and their difficulties and whatever emotion it is, you can express it, it seems like, so much easier, so much deeper in song or in music or in poetry than you can just by talking about it or or writing about it in, in, in that strict sense, I guess. And so the Psalms take that aspect of emotion and expressing emotion and and, and really put it to words. It takes life, life that is raw and unexpected and difficult and full of hardship. It takes all of that and puts it to words so that it might not, not only express the people who wrote it, but today we may read it, meditate, reflect upon it, and express that same emotion ourselves. And so Psalms, uh, the the, the word Psalm comes from a Hebrew word that just means praise. And so 150 chapters, or if you'd rather say 150 Psalms, again, sometimes people are overbearing when it comes to, well, you're supposed to say Psalm 1 or Psalm chapter 1, whether you view it as a book or a collection or or what have you. But Psalms is basically just a bunch of praises. It's a collection in poetry form of songs and prayers and things that were set to music originally. And it's sort of an anthology of of, of sorts, things that have songs and prayers that express, you know, as I said just a minute ago, different types of emotion. And it's very much unlike, say, one of Paul's letters or maybe the book of Joshua or, or something else because Psalms were not written just by one person, and someone didn't start writing the psalms one day and write all 150 psalms. It was a much more complicated process that took hundreds and hundreds of years. Um, Some of these psalms come from the monarchy, so the period of David and Solomon. Some of them come from the exile in Babylon, and some some of them even after the exile. And so a large uh, time frame is in view here. And so over time, these psalms were collected in this book that has the title psalms, but expressed different situations from, from different people. Now, perhaps the most famous psalms that, that, that we see are ones that have some sort of subs- uh, ascription to David. And a, a, as I said, some of the psalms originate from that time, and it, it's debated whether he actually wrote them, because in Hebrew, when you have something that says, to David, uh, Again, the, the, uh, not, not that it, you know, it is important you know, knowing the Hebrew, but um, basically it, it could either mean by David, as in he wrote them, or it could mean to or for David, in, in that someone wrote them and dedicated the Psalms to him. And so we think about like Psalm 23, which is read a lot at funerals and uh, was read on the movie Titanic. Um, 
that's free insight. But Psalm 23, I forget how it starts. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the ascription below it is a psalm of David. And whether you want to make the claim that these ascriptions below the, the chapter heading are original to the psalm or whether they were added later, whether they're in a sense, uh, in a sense inspired or not, again, people have a lot of different views on that, but... We know that definitely some of the Psalms, the ascriptions, whether they're by David or some of the sons of Korah, some of them are subscribed to, uh, some of those definitely aren't original. But whether David wrote Psalm 23, again, it seems to make good sense that maybe it matches up with his life. The, the one that I want to look at tonight, Psalm 32, is one that, again, is ascribed to David. And perhaps one of the more interesting ones, if you want to flip back, Psalm 18 has this kind of biographical note, talks about David who wrote this when Saul was chasing him and his enemies, so a long biography about when the psalm was written. And whether they were written by David or not, that, that doesn't really matter, at least I don't think. But just to be aware that these psalms are more than just poetry, but they're poetry in life. They encapsulate life. They, they express life. And to have that in mind, at least as we read the Psalm 32, together is important. As I said, these are songs and prayers. They were things that were prayed. They were, th that they were things that were sung. And they take the form of petitions, songs of trust, songs of thanksgiving, hymns. Some of them were used in Israel's worship, whether the Psalms, you have a few that's, that have the ascription songs of ascent. And these probably were used when people went to the temple. They would pray them or sing them. Others are victory psalms, which means that during conflict or fighting or war, they were prayed, or maybe after the fact, giving thanks to God for delivering them from their enemy. And then there are even others which aren't in the book of Psalms, but take that same form. Like in Isaiah 38, you have King Hezekiah of Judah who became ill, and he composed a prayer for, for divine help. And so sometimes you have those kind of things in the book of Psalms. Now the one that I want to look at, Psalm 32, is what, at least in Christian tradition, is called a penitential psalm. And basically that's just a long word talking about a psalm of confession or expressing the emotion of a contrite heart, I suppose. And so it relates to the expression of penance or wanting forgiveness or, or confessing wrong. Psalm 32 does that, Psalm 6, Psalm 38, Psalm 51, Psalm 102, 130, and 143, the seven penitential psalms. You, you can probably read a lot about that in, in commentaries or such. And so Psalm 32, if we're to jump into the text, which I want to do immediately, uh, starts with this beatitude. And you hear the word beatitude in relation to what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5 about blessed are the poor, blessed are the meek, blessed are the merciful. And so, in a way, the psalmist, whoever it is, David or who else, doesn't really matter, the psalmist expresses this beatitude, this happiness, this, this state of blessing that surrounds the one whose transgression, verse 1, is forgiven, whose sin is, co is covered. Happy are those to whom the Lord imputes no iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. And so the psalm begins begins this way, but I actually want to circle back to these couple verses here in a moment, and I want to proceed to these next few verses, which really get to the heart of what is at stake, what, what is the issue for the person who, who's writing this. And so in verse 3, as he expresses this silence and this wasting away and his groaning, it's a state of uh, devastation, it's a state, a state of sorrow, of grief, of pain because of sin and because of silence over sin. And as the psalmist makes clear, this is a human reaction for a person to want to conceal the sin, to hide the mistakes. And even not only from others, but even if you can imagine from God, who sees all and knows all. We are somehow taught from a young age, whether it's in families or even churches or schools or a lot of different settings, we're taught that to acknowledge sin and to embrace this transparency, this acknowledgement of how we've messed up, is somehow a risk that doesn't need to be taken. To risk 
the, the chance that you're judged and humiliated because of sin or because of mistakes is, is just too big of a risk. It, it's just not uh, necessary. And so the psalmist says that this is what he did at least to start with, that he hid his sin. He, he didn't acknowledge his sin. Instead, one ought to move on from the mistakes by sweeping them under the rug, covering them up in hopes that the reality and the guilt and the pain will just somehow go away. In this way, admitting defeat is something that we can't do because, after all, life's about picking yourself up by your bootstraps, although I really don't know what that means. Um, I just thought it should be said. And admitting defeat, so that state where we actually say that, yeah, I messed up, is somehow being weak and it's being vulnerable and it's being in a state that one shouldn't be because that, you know, makes that, uh, that makes one open for attacks and insults and humiliation and things like that. And because this is what the psalmist did, because he covered it up, because he remained silent, because he didn't confess it, sin took hold of him and it entrapped him and it beat him down. So he suffered tremendous emotional, spiritual, and yes, he even says physical turmoil, pain unimaginable. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as the heat of summer. I kept silent. My body wasted away through my groaning all day long. Sin is reality. Mistakes are a reality of who we are as human beings. It's a reality that each and every one of us must come to turn terms with. Because human existence, what it means to be human at one's core, is touched in every way imaginable by sin and by mistakes, the presence of which and the consequences of which often ruin life. Relationships are fragmented. Lives are broken. Death and despair are results. To ignore sin, we might think if no one knows about it, if, if we can just cover it up, then that makes things all right. But to actually ignore sin and not acknowledge it to God, to not take full account of one's mistake, to ignore it is actually to exacerbate it. The psalmist says in poetic terms here, uh, by appealing to not only his groaning, but his body wasting away, and, and what we should imagine when we think about what that means uh, could end up being a lot of things, but at least in this sense, maybe it could be some type of illness, some sort of psychosomatic thing where what you think or, or, or what, what you feel kind of makes you ill, so maybe it's that kind of thing. That's what psychosomatic means. But he also says God's hand was heavy upon him. That is a reference to divine punishment. And oftentimes in the Old Testament, whether it's the book of Job or, or Proverbs, oftentimes you have this hard and fast rule that sin equals, or, or sin at, and the consequence of which is God punishing that person. And sometimes it is, I, I guess. And, and to what extent that is true today, again, I, I don't think it's really knowable, but you know, there, 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 there's some sort of correlation, that there's some sort of relationship. And the psalmist takes full account of that by saying that God's hand was heavy upon him because of the state of sin and uh, covering it up. But in verse 5, he says, Then I acknowledge my sin to you, and I did not hide my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgression to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Silence brought illness, but acknowledgement brings healing and forgiveness. The answer to sin is not to act stronger, act tough, act like we are perfect, act like we can just take it by the horn, so to speak. But being human and making mistakes, which we all do, means that we accept our weak and, and, and fragile state. That to be human means that we also don't ha oftentimes don't have it all together. And so we are to, fall, to emulate what the psalmist does, or eventually does, in praying a prayer of confession. Notice that the psalmist does not stand in denial of a sin or some other act of defiance against God or, or against others, but he acknowledges that, yes, he messed up, and yes, he needs forgiveness. He confesses by openly, uh, openly acknowledging that it's my sin, Four different times he says, my sin, my sin, my sin, my sin. 
God expects us not to put on a pretense of perfection or the sense of false security, but to admit that we have messed up. The prayer of confession forces us to acknowledge the parts of us that we find most distressing and most terrible. And if we allow them to bring us to the state where we acknowledge that and where we are able to move on, at least really move on, then we don't have this state of self-loathing and, and regret that oftentimes we do have because we're not willing to take full account of what we've done. This prayer of confession is not only our attempt to elicit God's forgiveness, like, oh, I messed up, God, for, God forgive me, but we need to be made aware of what is lacking and what needs to be changed. Prayer, confession involves change. We pray to God and confess that we, even as mature Christians, are oftentimes inadequate, that we oftentimes make mistakes. But to remember that no forgiveness happens without sincerity and a contrite acknowledgement. A prayer of this magnitude, a prayer of this importance, is one that is humble and originates from humility, but also has a deep-seated trust in God. Because God forgives, erasing from his memory sin, the mistakes. And so we're encouraged to let this change us, knowing that whatever it is, whatever uh, are the consequences, whatever might be at stake, that this happens, that this it can happen for everyone and for everything. However, oftentimes, uh, again, this is a tough, difficult psalm to really grasp and to, and to really take to heart and, and, and to really allow it to, to change you in, in the important ways that you need to be changed. And so I note here just a few roadblocks to this type of confession, this type of transparency that needs to happen. And number one is this independence that is so admired in our culture that if we can grow up, move out of our home, get a job, have kids, support them, put them through college, all that, that, sometime, that, that somehow this streak of independence makes us feel strong or important or that we've actually grown up and succeeded. And in this culture of going it alone where you can't admit that you're wrong or you, you can't allow people to see your weakness or else they're just going to run right over you. And so it's that state of independence, that cultural ideal that oftentimes makes its way into church where we think that we have to be strong and we can't let other people see that we're not. But secondly, there's also this idea of perfectionism that oftentimes, sometimes I struggle with in a lot of different areas, but perfectionism makes it, it, perfection, perfectionism deceives us into thinking that we have to be perfect 100% of the time. And though we say, oh, well, we don't really believe that, but through your actions and through your decision to not be transparent, doesn't that really say that you kind of subscribe to this perfectionism? And number three, there's this ideal of secrecy. We oftentimes view the church as this fellowship of saints, when instead we should view it as it really is, a fellowship of sinners. And so we keep things secret. We let people uh, kind of stay at an arm's length. We don't really let them know who we are or, or what we're about. That's oftentimes the way... Uh, church is. And so because of this, we let people feel, feel alone in their sin and in their struggles, in their despair and in, in their disheartened state. We don't reach out and we don't ourselves reach out for help. And we don't reach out to, to help those who need help. Confession, though, normalizes the experience of sin. Again, because it's a human experience and it touches each and every one of us, sin is normal. That is, that, that, now, that's not to say that sin it should be normalized in the sense that we should just say, oh, well, that, that's who a person is, or we shouldn't really be too hard on someone, or you know, th th that sort of thing. But sin normalizes it in the sense that we know that everyone does it. And so shouldn't that at least cultivate this sense of commodity and, and, and the sense of community and the sense of everyone does it, so let's help one another through it. But the real uh, crux of this psalm comes after he's acknowledged it, after he's not 
after he's decided not to hide his iniquity, but he says, I will confess my transgression to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Therefore, let all who are faithful offer a prayer to you at a time of distress. The rush of mighty water shall not reach them. You are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with, gra- with glad cries of deliverance. Now, if you circle back to the Beatitude at the beginning, uh, the first couple of verses, happy are those whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Happy are those to whom the Lord imputes no iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. And as I said way at the beginning, I said that oftentimes poetry in Scripture takes this parallel form where one line and a couple words actually match up perfectly with the next line and the next few words. And so that, that kind of happens here. Again, three different words for sin. One is about rebellion or crime or offense. The, the, the second one is the idea of missing the way or missing the mark. And the third one is crookedness. And these themselves are paralleled in a, even, even another sense by three words for forgiveness. The first one is the idea of literally lifting the sin off the person. The second, covering it up. Not in the sense that the psalmist tried to cover it up, but in the sense that God covers it up. Covers it up to where you can't even know that it was there to begin with. And the third, no more accounting the sinner as guilty. Again, that's that's God's business and that's what he chooses to do. This is complete, life-changing forgiveness. Uh, I like this quote from a guy named uh, Eugene Lowry. The awfulness of human guilt needs redemption, not a lecture. And, and this is the type of forgiveness that God offers. Again, he's not going to allow people to just live their lives how they want and for that to go unnoticed. But if people are truly sincere in their apology and sincere in their confession, then one doesn't have to worry because this confession equals this forgiveness. Forgiveness might just be the greatest power in our lives, in in human life, because without forgiveness, all our relationships would deteriorate. They would crumble. Without forgiveness between one person and the next, eventually there would be so much hurt, so much heartache, so much despair, that those relationships would be so fragmented and so broken that really there wouldn't be any relationship there. Forgiveness does that. Forgiveness is a godly thing. It's something that's given by God, and it's something that we have the opportunity and we, have, and we, sh- we must have the desire, rather, to do. Forgiveness is God's business, but God expects, a, expects us to do it as well. Now, we don't do it as good as God does it. Again, oftentimes we fail in forgiving others the way we ought to but God nonetheless still expects it. Again, just, just another quote that I like, but C.S. Lewis, is, who wrote a lot, a lot of great things, a Christian writer, he said, we must trust God with our past as heartily as with our future. Oftentimes we pray and we take, take account of tomorrow or next year or 10 years from now, and we hope God will get us through that or get us to that point in life we want to be. But with that same hardiness with that same desire, with that same determination. We have to pray and confess to God and take full account of our past. Because it's only by taking account of one's past that one can actually move forward. Now in verse 7, again, uh, a very important point that I think is subtle, but I, I, I think it is vital. And that's this reference at the end of verse 7 to God surrounding me with glad cries of deliverance. Uh, appeal to the community. Again, it would have been the community of Israel or the community of exiled Israelites or, or whatever. And if we, we were, would, if we would read it today, we would say, well, this is a appeal to the Christian community, the, the, the church people surrounding us. And so confession and forgiveness must happen in community. Again, it, it's one sense to, it, it, it's, it's one thing to pray to God and ask for forgiveness, but there are is also this need to be accountable to each other. We ask ourselves how the church is to inform, engage in, and facilitate, encourage, and also adapt to this need of confession. And I ask that in a critical way because oftentimes I think 
our churches are often the worst at doing this. Again, you can get, uh, give me a flag afterwards, but I think churches of Christ are, are, are some at the worst, if, if not the worst, of practicing this. And I, th- I think this is because of a lot of things. It's tradition. It's because we don't want to be vulnerable. We don't want to acknowledge wrong, and, and we don't want to hear people's wrong. And when we do, we judge them and we criticize them. And, I'll, and you say, well, w- no one says that here, but people think that there and just go read Facebook. And I, I'm not accusing anyone or anything. I'm just saying that in general, sometimes these uh, environments are the ones where confession and forgiveness can't happen because we don't allow it to happen. Uh, James 5, again, I, I, I just want to refer to that. This is, again, the Christian ideal, which very much comes in the shadow of Psalm 32, I think. James chapter 5. The prayer of faith will save the sick, and the Lord will raise them up. And anyone who has committed sins will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another, and pray for one another so that you may be healed. The prayer of the righteous is powerful and effective. And again, this is probably part of the sermon where, because I'm overly critical, that you know I, I might get the flack for it. But there's this thing we do again, um, where after a sermon we have this invitation song, and then you know we expect people to come down front, and if they have public sin, which I, I, I guess I'd be critical of what public sin, um, but. We're, we're, and, you know, we, we have that kind of part where, you know, that, that, that's the expectation. And, again, I, I want to be critical, and I, I, I hope you want to be critical, because if we want to practice Psalm 32, then we need to critically evaluate what we practice. Again, I, I, I think that's what we should do in, in every sense of worship or church life or whatever we do outside these doors or inside these doors. We should critically evaluate in light of Scripture what we should do. And so it's my belief that oftentimes the environment we create with an invitation song and the expectation that people walk down front on a pew isn't the right way to do it. And I, I would encourage someone, if they disagree, to just show me where in Scripture the principle is because I, I, I just don't think it is. Again, um, it's a tradition that started really, not with Church of the Christ, but with... Uh, people in the 19th century, Methodist preachers who inherited this tradition from Anglican churches, which you know have roots in, in England, and these Methodist preachers wanted this uh, be, because back then Anglican churches and the Methodist churches, because they inherited it, you know had the Lord's Supper table and they had an altar, and you may see that in different forms today in different churches, but they wanted people to come, you know, come down front and ask for prayers for encouragement, things like that, and it morphed into this, uh, uh, you know, thing where. People have like these altar calls that you hear today, and you may uh, know the name Charles Finney, who was this 19th century Presbyterian preacher who really encouraged this and got that rolling for altar calls and invitation songs and things like that. And then Billy Graham and D.L. Moody are some of the more recent proponents that if you hear a Billy Graham sermon, you're going to have an altar call. And... Church of the Christ then, through, you know, if you trace the history, took that on and started implementing this thing that we have at the end of our sermons with invitation songs and invitations and, and things like that. And so you hear people like the famous Marshall Keeble who baptized like 20,000 people at tent meetings. And, and back then it, it was effective. And back then if you had, a, you know, so thousands of people gathered around to hear the gospel, well, let's baptize them. But to think that that's a timeless rule that is somehow biblical and timeless in the extreme sense like that, I, I, I just don't think it's right. Um, unfortunately, we have made the place of forgiveness in the life of the church, whether it's in worship or outside, a lonely and scary place. Again, who's going to come down front and, and say anything? I mean, I, I just don't understand how it's an it's a environment that cultivates that kind of response. And so throughout my time at different churches in Tennessee and Arkansas and different places, I've seen in the practical chain of events, other churches do this a lot better. Uh, for instance, there, there's a church uh, right around Freed Hardeman in, in Henderson, Tennessee, where instead of having like an invitation song, they don't have one. Instead of having an invitation, they don't have one. But after they worship, they have an elder and his wife in a separate classroom, and anyone who wants to 
have prayers or, or talk about baptism, things like that, they do that. So a, a much more comfortable setting. There's a church in Searcy, Arkansas, near Harding University, where they have an invitation song, but they don't have people come down front. They have elders stationed throughout, and you can go, and they circle up and pray, or they talk about things. So much more inviting, much more warm, much more comfortable, and I think much more in keeping with Psalm 32 and, and James chapter 5. But really all this harkens back to what is called vulnerability. And you say, vulnerability, well, that, that's not, I don't want to be vulnerable, that, that, that means I'm going to be weak. But actually, vulnerability is the core of all our emotions and all our feelings, whether it's anger or being hurt or sadness or despair or um, regret. All, all those things really, sh- uh, really stem from vulnerability. And, oh, goodness, I forgot the book back in the pew because I, I was going to read something from it. But... Um, Vulnerability, uh, Brene Brown, who I've referenced before, she's like this social worker, therapist, has a PhD, does all these TED Talks for thousands of people. And she defines vulnerability as uncertainty, risk, and emotional exposure, something that requires boundaries and trust. And this isn't vulnerability in the sense of like oversharing or indiscriminate disclosure or the celebrity style kind of social media information dumps where they have this long post and tell you about what's going on in their life. Like it's not that type of thing. It's not leading with, hi, my name is Jordan and here's my deepest, darkest secret or struggle or, or things like that. But vulnerability is something that has to, it, 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 vulnerability needs trust in order to work properly. Sharing and being vulnerable with the one who has deserved the right to hear it. And not just a social media dump. It's a mutual experience. Sharing with people who have developed relationships with that person. And so you say, okay, well, to be vulnerable with someone means I have to have a trusting, caring relationship with that person. To confess or to share what I want to share or confess. But how do you get that trust? Well, paradoxically... Actually, to get that trust means you have to be vulnerable. And so it's kind of a circular thing. To be vulnerable the way you should be vulnerable requires you have a trusting relationship with that person or with that group. But to have that trusting relationship means you have to be vulnerable. And so what comes first, the chicken or the egg, might be the question. But it's a thing that is difficult, a thing that is hard, a thing that requires a lot of us to reach out to someone and say, hey, I'm struggling, hey, I need prayers for this, hey, I need help. And again, I suggest that doing it during after an invitation song is not the right environment. And again, uh, I think that's tradition-based, and I, I, I think that maybe for us to reevaluate that would look a lot differently in a lot of different scenarios, and I'm not, not even going to get into that. But the second thing about vulnerability is that there's a difference between shame and guilt. Guilt is... I did a bad thing, and guilt is necessary. Shame is a terrible thing and should never be sought after because shame, instead of saying I did a bad thing, it says I am bad. Shame shuts us off from everyone and closes us down from any meaningful relationship. And so how might we in our daily lives as Christians, in our church life together here in worship, And one of the things I thought about when I started the supper clubs is that these are small, engaged, out-of-this-building environments where there can be relationship building, where there can be Christian growth, and where, yes, hopefully, maybe, at some point, when there's enough connection and enough uh, worthiness and a lot of trust, maybe in those groups they can take the form of something that looks like an accountability group, or there can be confessions or prayers or something, because... Uh, all it takes is a good meal sharing it with someone to really get to know someone. At least it, it starts that way. And so what does it mean for us to confess and for us to trust? Well, I, I guess it can mean a lot of different things. I, I think as church leaders, I think as just church goers, that we must critically evaluate what that looks like. And again, I, I have more suggestions, but I, I won't share them here. But the last thing I want to say is how the psalmist concludes the psalm in verses 8, 9, 10, and 11, where this confession, again, it, it started off bad, got better, and now it's, it's, it's looking pretty good, if you read verses 8 through 11. And it, it all revolves around this fact that there's confession, there's sincerity, 
all that, and there's forgiveness, there's the reality of forgiveness. God actually forgives and forgets, but that leads one to change, as I said, and it really is all about character formation. Realizing and acknowledging that it's not our job to fix it, it's not our job to have it all together, but it is our job to sincerely engage the process of forming ourselves spiritually, meaning that we have habits consistent with a life conform to the will of God. And that looks, again, a lot of different ways. But it involves at least this, that we have a sensitivity and consciousness of sin and its effects. Many times we will, even as Christians, even in this setting, we will experience pain and heartache and we'll be faced with the stark reality of what sin does and what sin is. But God expects us to confess it because God forgives and God heals. And secondly, because God expects us to be a Christian community, a church that emulates that same understanding and forgiveness. Again, there should be no judging, no criticism. Because God doesn't criticize in that same way. This psalm is an invitation to live a grace-filled life. One where there's always that awareness of forgiveness. Augustine, who was a guy who wrote a lot of different things, very important early in church history, like third, four centuries. When he was on his deathbed, it said that he had written on the wall opposite of his deathbed this psalm because it was so important to his life. We must assume the responsibility that this psalm calls us to, which is to take account of who we are and what we've done, but to realize that because of that, of who we are and what we've done, God has offered a way for us to be forgiven. But we must take the initiative to allow God to do something about it and to forgive us. And so, though I, again, though I encourage us to reevaluate it maybe and to be critical of it, we do be, have this opportunity where if you are willing to be courageous and are willing to step out and uh, confess something or ask for prayers or something, whatever it may be in life, or whether you're willing to talk about or actually follow through with being baptized into Christ, there is this opportunity available for us. Again, I would just urge all of us as we conclude that we must confess to God and to others. But more than that, how are we going to provide others with that environment, those who we interact with daily, those who we interact with here? How are we going to cultivate that loving, forgiving type of body? Let's stand and sing this song.